Good evening, dear all. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second edition of the Night of Ideas in Denmark. Every year, the French embassies and institutes celebrate the Night of Ideas all over the world on the same day. The goal of this international event is to facilitate the flow of ideas between countries and cultures, disciplines and generations. In Denmark, this event is organized by the French Institute in partnership with the University of Aarhus and DOCET. Today, we would like to divert and inspire you while spending some time together. Together, which is precisely the topic of this year's debate. A topic that we have decided to tackle in Denmark through the issue of food and short supply chains because France and Denmark are two important countries for food and agriculture and gastronomy as well. Food in our everyday, everyday life is what brings us together and reminds us of our connection with nature. Because eating is not only a need or a pleasure, it is also a social, cultural and ecological action. It's a meeting point between people, products, and territories. I find myself here at Torve Hallerne in Copenhagen, where every day hundreds of people come to choose their products, which means to look at their shape, at their color, to smell them, to, to know where they come from, what they taste like. It is somehow a journey through senses and imagination. This kind of French market is very popular in France. You can find them in thousands of cities and villages across the country. There, people love to meet the producers and to listen to them talking about their terroir. People are more and more concerned by the origin and the quality of their food as well as its environmental footprint. In other words, food has become a way to express one's ecological and political commitment. Beyond its political dimension, food also re reinforces social ties by drawing circles of family and friends together. This is why in 2010, the UNESCO decided to add the French gastronomic meal to the list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. There too, the epidemic had an impact, as half of French people declare that they now spend more time cooking than before the crisis. As everybody knows, food and gastronomy have always been a major aspect of the French way of life. And I'm sure that many of us would be interested to hear if through history, the French traditions and more recent evolutions regarding gastronomy had any influence in Denmark and reciprocally because the time of Babette is over. We can also wonder if we are now facing a real long-term change regarding short secrets and how much of an impact it will have on the global food system. I look forward to hearing to the inspiring interventions of our diverse speakers, whom I would like to thank for their participation. I wish you a very pleasant night of ideas. Très bonne soirée à vous toutes et tous. Thank you very much to the French ambassador, Caroline Ferrari, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, it was indeed a, a little bit cold and windy day, you could tell from the video, but I guess that's really a part of living in Denmark, uh, cold and windy days. But I hope all of you who are with us today, participating, watching, are sitting somewhere nice and warm and dry. And uh, my name is Lina Fries Felix, and I'm a science journalist, and I'll be moderating uh, the next couple of hours. And I would, of course, have loved to sit in front of you at Dogit in August, where this uh, event was originally scheduled to, uh, to take place. But I have quite a, a good feeling of, of 
you being out there somewhere. So uh, thank you for being with us. And I'm sure we'll have a couple of great hours. And for sure, indeed, we do have some very interesting people with us to share their knowledge and ideas and insights and wishes. So I will now introduce our panel. Um, and I should maybe mention before that, that the overall theme for La Nuit des Idées or the Night of Ideas, uh, which is happening worldwide. Uh, this year, the, the, the overall idea is being close or closeness. And the French Institute here in Denmark um, has chosen to look on closeness in relation to food. And I think it's, uh, there are many interesting things to discuss. So thank you to the French Institute here in Denmark for putting quite a lot of effort into putting this event together. And when it comes to closeness, closeness and food, we'll both touch issues like production of food, preparation of food, eating together, um, and we will touch upon climate and ecology and sociology and history. Um, so there are many interesting things to talk about. And as for the panelists, um, I would like to introduce first uh, Frédéric Ballet, who is a researcher at the French Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment. And he has specialized on rural development and he has worked in China and Brazil and of course with agriculture in, in France. And uh, Frédéric, you are with us from Toulouse in France. And um, I do think that you have brought some of your favorite French food. I don't know if you'll be able to show it to us, if we can get you on the screen, Frédéric. Can do. Yeah, good, good night, everybody. So uh, I'm uh, currently in Toulouse. That's my, my city. Uh, Toulouse is in the southwest of France. And uh, we have a lot of uh, 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 geographical indication in this region. And uh, I took uh, one of my favorite, I don't know if you can see it. It's, 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 a, it's a cheese, it's a goat cheese. Uh, it's a quite fresh one. And uh, with, um, uh, it's difficult to show that uh, uh, on, the, on, on the net, but uh, you, you can see that there are some strips here. And, uh, and it turns to blue uh, because of mushrooms uh, after 10 days of two weeks. And um, it's very famous here. Yeah? So it's both a geographical indication that means a link to terroir. And also for me, it's a local product. Thank you very much, Frédéric. Yeah. You could almost taste or smell the goat cheese from there. And we also have with us from France, Eric Bielouez. I hope I mentioned or pronounced your names right. You're a sociologist and historian and you have focused on agricultural engineering and on the value of social context of meals and a lot more connected to food production and food pre preparation and food intake. And it's, you have had this uh, broad historical look on it. And Eric, I know that you were with us from your home a little outside France and yes, that you have you. brought something with you that is very famous to France and uh, which you also think sort of describes the French food culture. Can you yes, show us a I, Yes, I'm sure everybody knows this. The French baguette, the traditional French baguette, it's not a very old product, but I think that uh, all people in France, they, they eat quite emblematic, this product. Thank you very much, Eric. And then we also have with us uh, Klaus Meyer, a Danish chef and entrepreneur. Um, he has started his career as, as a chef on TV here in Denmark, and now has a big business producing quality, high quality food. And, and all through his career, he has had this, um, this urge to try to persuade us Danes to eat healthier food, to eat, more local food and he was part of sort of getting our eyes open again to the Nordic um, food uh, scene, what we have of Nordic quality food. So he was indeed part of starting uh, this trend and today Klaus is not only Danish, you were sort of uh, selling your foods many places in the world. And I think you are with us from your home in Copenhagen, the family residence. And uh, I also do think that you brought something to illustrate some of your ideas of passion for food. I can't find my, my image on the screen, but you can see me? Yes. Okay. So um, I brought with me actually something that connects Denmark to France. 
So it's a, it's a wild uh, fermented, uh, it's almost a citre français. Uh, so it's, it's a farm, a farm type cider uh, made from French apple cider varieties, Boudin, Binet Rouge, and it does the quet. French cider varieties that, that I was part of importing uh, to a number of farms in Denmark uh, 12 years ago. Uh, so with these French bad apple varieties, we produce a, a, a pretty decent um, cider. Thank you very much, Klaus. And then we have Chris Kelsen with us. He's a researcher from the University of Aarhus and he has specialized in looking at alternative food networks. Um, and, and looking at animal welfare and food culture and environment, rural urban relations and organic food production. So a lot of things that comes into question when you talk about uh, short circuits and being closed in, in food production. And I know that you were with us from, from Ranas, Chris, and that you also have brought something that illustrates what you are working with. Can you show us that, please? Yes. Uh, it's all uh, bubbled stuff, and the, the first example is uh, an uh, apple juice from the west coast of Denmark. It's not, it's uh, still some 80 kilometers away from my house, but it's a single variety uh, apple juice uh, made by a company uh, called Westhaus Most, uh, who produce uh, 16 different varieties of uh, single variety apple juice, and uh, they're growing in apple plantation on a location which is deemed a disaster for apples, but they are, they are 30 years on, they are, they are proving that it's actually possible to... Uh, uh, and I brought some other stuff too. There's a dandelion uh, liqueur, uh, also from the Danish West Coast, uh, produced by a, a company who more or less uh, just walks out the door and harvests anything in the garden and, and creates liqueurs. Uh, they're, they're uh, at least in, in my mind, they're one of their very, uh, very good products is also li uh, liqueur made from lime grass uh, from the coast, which, uh, and then uh, a local product from my uh, home region, uh, that's an uh, apple spirit uh, made by uh, Cold Hand Winery uh, near Ranas. Uh, the uh, apples used for this one is from uh, Funen though, but, um, they are, uh, they are extracting an apple extract and then, and then they add the uh, Eau de Vie uh, to the apple uh, extract. So there is a link to France there too. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention that the West Coast people also produce vinegar, uh, which uh, as Klaus described, uh, is taking apples uh, a step further. So that, that's all examples of uh, very focused work with uh, emphasizing local taste. Mm. Thank you very much, Chris. And I think that indeed does emphasize the growing markets the last decade or so um, for people wanting to buy local stuff and, and for all these little um, companies popping up around the countryside. And then our last uh, final um, panelist is Christopher Korshoi. And Christopher, he started out his career as working as a chef, but then he decided after some years in that business that he wanted to be a gardener. And today he is a professional gardener and he's growing his own food and he's growing food also for a restaurant called Titre Nil, 10 Steps Down, um, who has a Michelin star. And, and they have this agreement that he delivers a lot of very interesting and not very common food. And he's also delivering uh, food for other restaurants and uh, Christopher you are with us from Fredericia. Yeah. I know that you brought something from your own garden. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I brought a, a, a variety of, uh, of stuff. For instance, I brought this, uh, which is uh, not, uh, not too many people are familiar with this, but this is like an old uh, kind of uh, cabbage called uh, kohlrabi. Or glasskohl in Danish it has a yeah, there's always a lot of confusion around the name, but it's a it's a beautiful vegetable that has been basically forgotten in Denmark. Uh, I don't know when it disappeared uh, from uh, from the the production, but now it's kind of uh, finding its way back to the 
to the shelves even in, in the supermarkets. But I think the whole Nordic uh, Nordic cooking uh, trend has uh, like kind of created a loophole for all these amazing uh, kinds of uh, vegetables to like sneak in to uh, into our daily lives again. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and also it should be healthy. I just read a couple of years ago um, some research from a Danish researcher and he had looked at some of the older vegetables that were not sort of made to only grow very fast and be very sweet. And, and it seemed like that, that at a lowered people's blood sugar being better for diabetics, etc. If, if you ate these older yeah. Danish vegetables with more bitterness in them. So I think indeed it will be good in many aspects to eat yeah. some of the older stuff and then um, we have one more person with us who is not part of the discussion but who will help us put some pictures on and it's an, a French illustrator Jean-Michel Peschi he is living in, in Denmark now and if we are lucky then Jean-Michel can uh, share his screen with us so we can see if he has already been putting yeah, some yeah. This should work. This should work. On. Hopefully, when I'm done, I will be happy to do so. Thank you. For oh, okay. Coming. So, okay. So he will start drawing later, and then he will sort of illustrate some of what we are talking about, I and then uh, he will show us. Well, uh, we have a few videos to show you during uh, the next couple of hours, but I would just like to start with two questions before we will show you a small video with a French historian who will take us all back to the to the French Empire. But first, I would like sort of to, to get the, the discussion started. And I would like to start with you, Frederic Vallée, because, um, you know, I have this idea and people I talk to have this idea that this by local or short circuits trend is really growing these years. But is that true? Could you, out from your research, your perspectives, could you tell us what has happened during the last decade and especially maybe during the last year with the corona crisis? Because I've heard some rumors about that, that uh, buying local has become even more um, prevalent. Yeah. Um, the, the success of uh, short circuits in France is uh, rooted in the history of French agriculture uh, because uh, from a long time we had uh, direct sales in farms and so on. But uh, then it has been renewed uh, with the, by the end of the 90s because of uh, uh, some crisis, uh, crisis uh, in uh, uh, agriculture, crisis uh, like my, uh, Matco, for example. And because of that, people tried to be uh, secure uh, about their food, and uh, they, they they had an, an, a growing interest in uh, the origin of food, uh, growing interest uh, of the uh, to the link with uh, farmers and to know what uh, is in the in the plate. So uh, since now uh, two decades, we have uh, a very dynamic movement. Uh, in, for um, short circuits in France, and uh, it takes uh, a very diverse um, uh, configuration. Uh, for example, uh, you have uh, direct sales, picking, uh, also um, uh, street markets, farmer baskets, uh, uh, con um, producer stores, but also uh, in canteens, retailers. Uh, in restaurants and, and so on. And for, for the last period also, uh, supermarkets uh, turned to, to that uh, kind of, uh, um, to that kind of, of provision uh, circuits uh, because with a, a growing interest for a local food, for example. So uh, we can say, for example, to give you some, just not too many, but some, some figures uh, if you if you look at the CSA, this means uh, the uh, community supported agriculture. Uh, in France, the name is AMAP, and today we we have uh, three uh, thousand AMAP in France, for example, and we also have something like five hundred producer stores. So uh, it's it's very dynamic, uh, and it is growing every every year, and uh, so the, there is a uh, short circuits uh, can be considered as kind of answers uh, to the need to have uh, a bit of uh, knowledge uh, about the origin of food. 
So uh, you ask also about the impact of COVID crisis. Uh, what we saw uh, with the COVID crisis is uh, first answer is that uh, the, the ability of uh, the, the supply chain, uh, long or short supply chain to answer uh, to the needs and to the crisis. The, a, a, a very good resilience uh, of the two kind of uh, uh, of uh, supply chains, but uh, also as, as it was mentioned before uh, in the video, uh, people uh, find an, a new interest uh, in cooking, uh, in uh, uh, having a direct link with farmers, with producers. Uh, that was the, the situation during the lockdown. But uh, finally, with uh, uh, some months, uh, uh, some months uh, later than the, the, the first uh, times of the crisis, what we can see is that uh, most of people uh, went back to the routines. So it's not obvious that uh, uh, the, the COVID changed uh, a lot the practices of food, in food. Uh, but some of uh, of the pop some uh, some people in the population uh, have um, a growing interest in local food, a growing interest in cooking. Um, but it's it's so the result is not so obvious. And uh, what we what I read uh, in during the last uh, weeks is that uh, the winners of this uh, crisis is uh, frozen food companies and also uh, um, uh, enterprises like Amazon, like uh, this kind of uh, provider uh, that, uh, that saw their, um, the, the, the share of the, of the market increase a lot. So um, the, the result and the impact of COVID crisis uh, is, is uh, not so, uh, so clear. Uh, because at the same time, the, there is this interest for uh, short circuits and also uh, um, a growing uh, um, purchasing, uh, uh, purchasing action in uh, to, um, direct to a frozen food company, for example. So. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, and, uh, and as always, your answer shows us that the world is more complex than we often <laughs> think of it. Um, and uh, I would like to ask you, Klaus Meyer, and also just saw that you raised your hand, but I, I had also planned actually to ask you, um, as a food activist, as you at least really started out with, um, why did you actually think that was important for you? Why was it important for you to, to tell Danes to eat higher quality food, to buy more local food, to eat Nordic food? What was your passion at that time when you started? When I started, that is back in 83, when I came back, well actually 84, when I came back from one year spent as, a, as an au pair boy in uh, Gascony, in the southwestern part of France, in uh, the city of Agen, the global capital of prunes. And the thing is I ended up being uh, more or less adopted by a family, a uh, wife, Elizabeth, and her husband, Guy, who was a fourth generation baker and chef and traiteur in Agen, uh, 47 Boulevard de la République. And uh, that became the best year of my entire life. And, and the thing is that, that my childhood was a little bit rocky in the sense that my parents divorced when I was 14 years old. I didn't see my father more than a few times um, for the next four or five years and my mother became an alcoholic and food was shitty. So somehow uh, spending one year in some sort of culinary nirvana in Agen, and also he and Elizabeth, they could not have children. So they treated me without me at all seeing this coming. They just treated me with the same love they would have um, provided for their biological son. And that came as a very big surprise because I was formerly on a recreation from a formal au pair uh, stay with a dentist in Paris, who was a pretty, pretty uh, more like a more rational, not so emotional. Uh, so it was a very wonderful surprise. And, and uh, eventually this, and, and the way Guy was, uh, almost acted like a father to me, a uh, father figure, 
He was a very spiritual, uh, philosophical man and an incredible baker. Uh, so somehow I, this turned into a calling. So I went back to Denmark when I was 20 years old with the firm idea that I had to change food because I, I believe that from what I've seen in, in France, there was love for everyone, an abundance of love and an abundance of deliciousness. So I thought if I could only change deliciousness, love would come as a result. Great. So that is how, that was the first wave. So I became a, an incredible proponent of everything French for 10 to 15 years. Uh, and only then in 2002 did I realize that, and that he actually, before he died in, in 2002 or three, he, he told me that I had, I had done enough for France but that he thought that the true mission in my life should be to uh, rediscover uh, the qualities and, and uh, the potentials in our own landscapes and in our own terroir, in our own territory. And I've never ever, you know, at all been close, even close at uh, working from that perspective until then. And that is when within 24 months, we, we formulated the Nordic Cuisine Manifesto and started NOMA. Um, that should work uh, as, in, 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 I mean, as dedicatedly with uh, local ingredients uh, as any top uh, French restaurant uh, located in uh, whatever specific terroir. And uh, people thought it was a joke because in, in contrast to France, we, had, we, we didn't have all these small scale um, uh, refined producers uh, turning, you know, carrots and potatoes or grapes or milk into wonders. So it was almost an utopian idea to create a, an ambitious world-class restaurant based on Danish products. But we set out to do it and, and eventually we made it work in some sort of synergy with um, similar transformations of the mindset of farmers and, uh, and, and, and small-scale artisans. So I guess if we, we set out, a, we, 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 we managed to initiate some sort of wave or movement that um, in, in a chaotic and uncoordinated way produced, uh, you know, very important results without anyone trying to steer this, um, this avalanche. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus. And indeed, the, the restaurant Noma probably you all know it, but it won several Michelin stars uh, as long as it existed. And it was uh, indeed very, uh, very, very, very famous. Still, still we, kind of exists, even though it's been troubled a little by Corona. Okay, yeah. And it's so it's not around, yeah. but we all shut down for the moment. And yeah. just to get my question also, um, uh, so, so my question to Frederick was, what, so this, those 3,000 CSA uh, consumer supported agriculture. So what is the typical way this plays out in France? I don't know when you want to answer this question, but I just would love to hear how, how these CSAs are usually organized in France. I think we can just take, if you can answer it quite quickly, Frederick, then we'll yeah. just answer it before we forget it, and then we'll move on. Okay, just a, a, a very quick answer. Uh, we have different configurations. Sometimes we, we, they go directly to the farm and uh, people, uh, uh, AMAP is a contract uh, between consumers and producers and they contract for one year and they say to the producer, okay, we're gonna buy your product for one year. And uh, it can be, di uh, it, it can be a, a direct relation with one producer or it can be something that more collective uh, with some places where, where the producers mix their production and, and meet the, the consumers. So, so we have different configurations. So, so basically it's, it's a farmer. If we take a simple one, one farmer, one group of consumers, there's a hundred families and one farmer, a chicken farmer, hundred families. Then, then, no, then. Usually it's not 100. Is that again? It's, no, usually uh, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not so much. Uh, we, we are more around something like uh, 20 or 40 for, uh, uh, families, not, not one on one. It's so typically 20 to 40 families getting yeah. together and organizing, say we all want to buy chicken from this man. No, 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 it's not, no, no, it's not collective. It's, uh, uh, you can go by your, by, by your side and, and uh, 
uh, have a, a direct relation with the, the farmers and, and I can go by my side uh, without coordination with it, we, uh, between us. And then you go collect your chicken yourself to, uh, in some sort of structure every week or? We, yeah, yeah. I think also maybe Christopher, because actually I plan to show the video right now, but I know that you've worked with CSA and been, been part of a CSA community in Denmark. Um, yeah. So maybe, I don't know if you have a few, just short. Yeah, could, I can explain it to, uh, yeah. I can explain it to Klaus Meyer so that you, you, you'll understand it. Like uh, the, the, simple, the simple way to, to set it up is, is that you have a farmer uh, who has a farm. And then you have some uh, people who are interested in eating something, maybe vegetables. Like it's most commonly made uh, with uh, vegetables in Denmark, at least. With what? Vegetables, produce. Uh, uh, yeah, vegetables. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you the like you pay like as a consumer you pay a, a fee, a set fee. So that could be maybe four thousand kroner a year. And then you have uh, vegetables, all the vegetables that you want. And you can either come and pick them up on the farm or you can uh, pick them up uh, at a de designated uh, collecting area somewhere in a trailer or a cooler. Or so, so, Christian, like so, so, so do, does the farmer start growing these vegetables once there is enough consumers to provide for a salary or how does it work? Yeah, but that's the the issue is that uh, like yeah, where do you start? It? Is it the chicken or the egg? Like, what? Who comes first? Of course, you can have a group of consumers that go together, say, "Oh, we really want fresh uh, vegetables," and then they find a farmer or go ask uh, the neighbor or farm to to grow vegetables, and they make an e economic agreement. But uh, in in the case with uh, at least my age uh, farmers, uh, the situation is the other way around because we really want to grow a diverse uh, range of vegetables, uh, plants, and uh, that's uh, basically not uh, possible with the, the current economic model for growing food because it's like the more different vegetables you grow, the more hands you need to grow it, like the more man, man hours it takes. And uh, yes, so it's uh, usually okay. like you, you have to do a lot of footwork to get it, get it going. And the place that, that I worked was, uh, he had almost 200 uh, uh, participants who paid maybe 4,000 or something like that. But, but Christian, just for one minute, and then I will stop. So, so if you, you say that people pay like 4,000 and they can get everything they want, I guess that is not possible. Because if you grow special things and people just want, you know, a lot of potatoes and a lot of peaks, maybe, maybe you, maybe there's not enough for everyone. So do people no, get kind of whatever, do they get the same amount as if they were, you know, on a scheme with Austin, for instance? Uh, actually, they get more, I would say. Uh, more, yeah, there's more value uh, for the money. But it's also like, uh, yeah, the place... Uh, the one place that I'm talking about, it's a, it's a bigger scale place. It's not the place that I'm uh, working now. The place I'm working now is, is mainly for restaurants. So it's a lot of weird, weird stuff. Um, but the other place, they, like we were overproducing food. We were overproducing potatoes and stuff. Like we were selling to uh, Angro companies, like uh, Solule, because we had a surplus of vegetables. But it, so, sounds, uh, yeah. it sounds indeed very interesting. And I think if any one of you following us tonight, I know there's around 150 um, people hooking up and maybe some of you are sitting in two or three or more people watching us. So it's uh, like having at least a full uh, dog it in Aarhus. So that is really great. And if some of you are interested, it's called CSA Community Supported Agriculture. Um, then you can look it up and see if you can uh, support it so we can maybe have more of that. And thank you, Jean-Michel Jean Pachet. Your drawings are really nice and it's, uh, it's nice for the eyes to look at them. So we are looking forward to what you're going to draw for us the rest of the night or the evening. But now I think we should have the, um, the video with the Dimitri 
Tilois d'Ambrosie. Uh, he's the historian of uh, gastronomy under ancient Rome. So let's see how they uh, got food, if they were self-supplied uh, in the ancient Rome. Roman cuisine can seem exotic because of the complex mixtures of ingredients in some recipes. Also, eating lying down with your fingers may seem strange to us. But in reality, we have a lot in common with the Romans. The geographical origin of the products is always very important in our cuisine. The Roman also had a precise classification of great prestigious wines. The banquet is the most important space for sociability, especially for higher social categories. It is essential to be able to invite and to be invited. This shows the importance of the social network. Very often, the guests are friends of the same social rank. However, lower ranking people may be invited, and the banquet then appears as a space where social hierarchies can be seen. Hospitality is an essential value at the banquet, where many social and cultural rules apply. In Augustus' time, Italy was no longer able to feed the capital city with more than one million inhabitants, which means that other sources of supply had to be found, such as in Northern Africa, in Egypt, in Sicily, for example. The expansion of the Roman Empire made it possible to discover and find new foods. With the control of the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea also, some fish are highly prestigious and very, very expensive. New fruits are imparted from the East. Peach, apricot, cherry, for example. From the Far East, spices are imparted, such as pepper, from the reign of Augustus, so between 27 before Christ and 14 AD, Rome, the capital city, has a population of more than 1 million inhabitants. Emperor Augustus organizes an administration to buy wheat in Egypt. The wheat then arrives in Ostia, the port of Rome. It is stored in huge granaries along the Tiber. It is then distributed free of charge to the citizens thus providing a living wage to the poorer citizens. It is possible to speak of globalization on the scale of the Roman world. The network of communication on roads contributed to the unification of the empire. But trade also took place with territories outside the empire for example in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Arabian Peninsula, in the Far East. However, in comparison with today, the demographic and food problems are not the same. However, nutritional problems were common in ancient Rome. For example, traces of deficiencies and skeletons are common. Above all, the idea of globalization of the Roman Empire needs to be qualified, the majority, of the population, its food produced nearby, in the countryside, for example, just outside uh, of the walls of the city. I think that, in some ways, the Roman Empire can be a source of inspiration for our thinking about the carbon footprint of our food system. Roman morality and philosophy advocates moderation and frugality, for example, by eating mainly vegetables products. In the ancient world, nothing is wasted, but everything can be reclaimed and used again. This is the proof that antiquity can teach us useful lessons for building the future. So thank you to Dimitri for this uh, nice little session on the Roman Empire and I saw the video for the first time a couple of, couple of days ago and I was quite surprised that they actually imported food from so far away. Um, 
and he also got into the social hierarchy in food and some of the troubles and we'll get back to that later. But first, Eric uh, Bielues, I would like to, uh, to ask you because as I said, I was surprised that, that you actually had a globalized world already in, under the Roman Empire when it came to food. And was it then something that was forgotten again and, and then, you know, just exploded the last 50 or 60 years? Um, or if you take sort of the, the historical view from the Roman Empire and up until now, has it been going forth or back? Or how has the, the development been? Okay, in two minutes. <laughs> in two minutes. <laughs> yes, um, if you try to have a historical approach, it's true that for thousands of years, food has always traveled from one region to another, from one country to another. It was a necessity because there could be a bad harvest of cereal, for instance, or a lack of food stocks. And uh, I'd like to give you some uh, example. Um, in the Middle Ages, the hinterland of a big city like Florence in Italy only provide five months of grain reserves. And if the other regions of Italy couldn't provide the missing wheat, the government of the city of Florence had to buy the wheat in South Russia, in Crimea. Uh, so you understand that uh, the national or the local authorities, they had to import grain from other areas and sometimes remote areas in order to feed their population. In order to feed the peasants and above all, above all the citizens. The citizens, because what feared most the political authorities were the urban riots. Imagine thousands of hungry urban people who quickly gathered in the streets of the cities, something very dangerous for the power. And that's why long circuits with many intermediaries existed yet in ancient times. I'd like to give you another example relative to Denmark, the herring. I suppose you know the herring. From the beginning of the Middle Ages, the church, you know, imposed abstinence from meat on Fridays and during the Lent. So it was necessary to supply all the areas of Europe with fish with dried, with salted herring. And this herring was caught by Danish fishermen in the Atlantic Ocean and the Baltic Sea and herring traveled through uh, Europe. And last example uh, concerning Denmark, uh, also during the medieval period, German big cities needed large quantities of meat. And this meat, pork, beef, came from Denmark, from Poland, from Angria, but the animals were not killed, were not slaughtered in, in, in the country of birth. They were not killed in, in Denmark. Oxen, they had to walk hundreds of kilometers to reach their destination. And along the way, there were pastures that allowed animals to rest, uh, to, to gain weight, of course. And at this time, one of the major political issues was the control of oxen roads. But, last point, apart from these examples, when, when crops are normal, most people ate local food and the short circuits were dominant. The peasants, who formed the large majority of the population, ate the cereals, the pulses, they grew themselves in their fields. The vegetables came from their own gardens, uh, the pigs, uh, poultry, they raised themselves the plants, the fruits, mushrooms, and the small animals they found in the countryside and in the forest. And concerning the urban people, a large part of the food eaten by the citizens came also from the nearby hinterland and from the town itself. You know, uh, what we call today urban agriculture and short circuits are not a new phenomenon. They exist since the dawn of time. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, and you saying that most people, especially in the countryside, they ate local foods, that, that fits very, got, uh, very well with my um, impression because my grandparents, you know, in the 1940s, they grew their own food and I think they ate only 
what of came course. from a radius of, of 10 kilometers. And actually it's my grandmother's old sofa I'm sitting in and I still remember she was growing these little radishes, you know, yeah. and they tasted from so much more than the one I can buy in the supermarkets today. Uh, so it has really been a shift uh, through the last 60 years and 80 years. And the very interesting thing is that both several of you have mentioned that early on, it was the rich people who bought the exotic food that was imported. And actually right now, which we yes. do, it's the rich people who are able to buy the local food. So it's like it's it's flipped, but I think we'll get back to that because now I would okay. like to, to talk to you, Chris. And I can see you were nodding several times while mm. Eric was talking. Um, and Frederick, he sort of summed up what he saw, especially in France during the last decade of local foods um, and under the Corona crisis. And even though Denmark and France are in many ways quite close, I still see the, the food culture as also quite different. So could you please illustrate to us what does it look like in Denmark? What are the patterns that we see with short circuits and buying local here in Denmark? Yeah, there's uh, <clears throat> developments are definitely um, improving, I think. And in, in many ways, the access to uh, local or specialty foods has improved uh, dramatically. And, and the, the work done by Klaus uh, has been uh, very, very important in that degree to uh, create a cultural discourse which can provide meaning and, and uh, a cultural backcloth uh, to uh, the value uh, embedded in, in, in these products. Um, yeah, you can mention that uh, the supermarkets are offering opportunities to uh, source uh, local produce like a co-op uh, is uh, in the middle of developing a market platform for uh, regional co-op shops to uh, source uh, local food uh, but you uh, it's not only in, in the supermarkets you you also see a, a very positive uh, development in uh, specialty shops uh, but also networks like uh, the Danish food communities uh, in, in Danish uh, they are among the fastest growing uh, organizations in, in the alternative scene, uh, so to speak. Uh, you also see uh, motivated producers, which keeps on emerging in the Danish foodscape, like uh, people on the West Coast, people on Western Zealand, uh, people on uh, all sorts of locations where, where motivated uh, farmers pop up. Um, so there are definitely many promising uh, also structural developments in uh, recent years uh, followed by the uh, sorry following the the interest in the uh, in the nordic uh, and uh, uh, the nordic countries as terroir or a bio region uh, which can source uh, where where you can definitely also gain great experiences and, uh, and learn a lot about your your own uh, region um, it should be said, of course, uh, that uh, the notion of uh, effective farming and uh, being very rational with concerns to food culture is a specific characteristic for, for Denmark. The notion of the effective farm has been uh, pursued since uh, the last part of the 19th century in Denmark. Uh, as an example, uh, we uh, politically, um, farms couldn't be divided, but should be traded in one piece, uh, which, which runs co contrary to uh, developments in, uh, say, Italy and France, where, where you can inherit uh, farms. You can't do that in Denmark. You're, you're selling farms in, in one piece, and, and that was more than 150 years ago, a policy objective that, that you should be able to make a living which is comparable to uh, the urban population from doing farming. And that, that has had a profound influence on, on uh, our farming structure. Uh, coupled with the intense focus on developing export uh, products uh, that has 
really cast a long shadow, so to speak, in, in how you develop uh, high quality products, uh, also with regards to the notion of what constitutes uh, high quality. Thank you very much, Chris. And, and then Klaus, I would like to answer you, or ask you again, because your company is producing tons of foods every year, going out to restaurants, supermarkets, specialty shops. So, I mean, you'll be able to tell from the orders you get every day, what is the trend right now? So do you still see a growing trend of Nordic food, local food, or what are people asking for? Well, we're not producing that many vegetables. I mean, we are the, the Mayas in co-op and the Lucas Mose in Neto is um, almost, well, it's, it's not a lot of vegetables, uh, but I mean, um, to, to your point, what are people demanding? I actually, even though we are a little bit, I mean, we are late movers when it comes to private people connecting with local farms. Um, on the restaurant scene, we were probably first movers globally. Uh, well, and, and then again, we were basically just scaling the French concept of terroir and then changing the food on the plate. But what we applied or what we kind of re-emphasized was the importance of time and place, seasonality and terroir. And, and that has been invented in Southern Europe, not by Danes. But then we, then we came in with, chimed in with a new flavor paradigm or a new way of cooking that would emphasize the ingredient and not the chef. Um, but so, so when it comes to restaurant food uh, and finding that new tonality in fine dining that was more popular in a way and anti-elitarian anti uh, and well democratic uh, unlike typical French Michelin food that is kind of a little bit hierarchical uh, because it distinguishes between rich and, you know, educated people and then the ordinary people who eat their local steak tata. Um, but but we, are, we are lacking behind a lot uh, when it comes to private people connecting with local farmers. But as uh, uh, Christopher was alluding to, this is coming. I mean, I am in sax cribbing, as well as in know-how privately or through some of the corporate activities involved in uh, various projects. Uh, at one place it's called land art, uh, but that's just a notion. That's in Lolland and Falster. Uh, and in know-how, we, we are basically creating a new mini city with 3000 inhabitants in something called Tunnelfabriken, the tunnel fabric. Uh, and 1,000 young students and 2,000 kind of co-workers and maker spaces. And we're trying to use that, uh, that, that um, building or establishment of a new city to make an experiment, which is to see how well we can reconnect city and land or citizens and farmers. So, so the idea, Christopher, is to make a, a, a massive CSR, a CSA project where we, we might even go as far as to adopting 40 cows outside of Copenhagen or hiring a bunch of young vegetable growers and buying everything for them from them and then using that both in restaurants and in the private people's lives and, and cutting away, uh, you know, three layers of middlemen. Um, so this is coming also because of, because there's a, there's a, in addition to the whole idea of having meaning and purpose and sustaining the, the life of the, and the economy of the farmer and creating a, 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 a communality, a togetherness around the food system and not a division, there is also the fact that this will uh, by any means have a positive impact on the biodiversity and the climate crisis. So both because of a, uh, a longing for a, me a sense of meaning uh, in respect of the farmer and also to combat major challenges facing our civilization, this is booming uh, in the next 10 years in Denmark beyond any doubt. 
very interesting to hear about your big scale project also because I know Christopher that that economy can be can be an issue how do you get young farmers started it takes a lot of money to buy land uh, Chris you were just raising your hands uh, during Klaus's answer do you have a comment I, I, uh, just a comment uh, based on uh, a colleague and I did a study of the Danish food community some years back and and we we started out perhaps very idealistically with an expectation that, that people were demanding uh, very specific, uh, they d demanded new varieties of vegetables or fruit and then were very uh, concerned with uh, exploring the, the properties of the specific products. But, but that level of skill was yeah, for some reason missing from, from many of the, the members we, we talked to during uh, interviews. So that it's just to mention that there can be many projects going on within the alternative food networks and, and it does uh, require a certain level of uh, skill to appreciate the uh, specific varieties of plums or uh, like some of the products Christopher is uh, producing. Uh, that, that might also, so I think building skill is a very important dimension. And, uh, but there can also be other projects like, uh, I remember one of the members said that, okay, he didn't know that much about food, but it was a good way to meet women uh, to become a member of uh, the food communities. And that's a perfectly valid uh, motivation to go into uh, such work because, Apart from meeting women, they are, they're actually doing good, good uh, work. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it might be a silly example, but, but it, there can be many projects going on. And with regards to integrating uh, farmers with consumers, uh, I think at least some level of caution should be uh, put there. It, it doesn't just come on its own because as one of the farmers we interviewed, said that he actually preferred not to be uh, entirely uh, relying on one specific food community for all his produce. He actually preferred uh, a differentiated distribution structure. So he, he wasn't in the pocket of uh, one particular association. Uh, so it might not be entirely straightforward because uh, there is a distribution of uh, economic risk uh, which should be considered. And I'm very concerned uh, about uneven distribution of risks in, in that regard, because uh, it, it, the farmer has a weak bargaining position uh, when uh, sitting around the table with 100 urban consumers. So very interesting to hear about some of the complications or challenges there can be. And, and you, Chris, also mentioning that it was a way to meet uh, women can me to remember that we did have a question uh, about why it was only uh, male uh, panelists uh, in the debate today, and, and I um, and I should say from the French Institute in Denmark that they actually did invite a couple of women, but they couldn't come. Um, and also, they then just mentioned that just a couple of days ago, uh, two female uh, chefs received, I think, two Michelin stars, so which was really really big. So it's not because of bad will there are no women, but because they couldn't. Uh, and Christopher, I saw you raised your hands and I know this thing about a variety and diversity of food is something on your mind. So um, please come with your comment. Uh, yeah, I was just, uh, it was just uh, to fill in a little bit about uh, what Chris was saying. Um, and it's a lot about educating people and teaching people to appreciate uh, a certain quality, a proper quality of food uh, and produce. And it's also about uh, educating uh, restaurants uh, to, to learn that uh, you have to commit to get high quality produce. Like you can't just uh, call your, your caterer, like uh, BC uh, catering or whoever, is your grocer and 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 buy all your produce from there if you want to have a great seasonal taste in your food then you will get the convenience it's a little bit like uh, choosing whether to uh, cook yourself uh, or whether to just go to a mcdonald's uh, and uh, eat, eat a hamburger or something like that 
So uh, it's a lot about commitment as well. So you need to like, you need the restaurants to commit to this, uh, to the whole idea of, of using like proper quality produce and like, yeah, and, and food stuff. And uh, yeah, it just, it takes some, uh, some convincing, but I think like if you are a farmer, a young farmer like me, and you just contact, uh, take contact to the restaurants. I know a lot of restaurants that are interested in getting their own, their own production. And as long as the restaurants, they can put kind of put their label on the, on the vegetables, then uh, it increases like the value of the agreement so much more because uh, they can use it as a commercial value that they can say, oh, this is uh, produce from my own farm. So uh, that kind of helps a little bit with the, with the, the economics of, uh, of the production. Mm. But I think in general, it's uh, like you're, you're not going to make uh, proper money uh, growing vegetables ever. Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> but at least we as consumers, and I think that's a big uh, issue in Denmark than in France, I think Denmark is one of the countries where we actually spend the, the, the least part of our monthly wage for food. We, we buy new kitchens or cars or travel. We don't spend a lot of money on food, which I think is something both you, Klaus, and you, Christoph, and maybe also you, Chris, would like to change. But now, Frederik, I thought that you raised your hands. Oh, you have to turn on your microphone. Yes, sorry. Uh, the, the very inter uh, interesting discussion. I just wanted to add the two two aspect. The first one is that uh, linked to this to the uh, issue of uh, local food, terroir food, and so on. What we see uh, also is that the increased consumption of processed food, uh, and uh, with education, there is also this idea to go back to naturality. Um, we, education is education to the product, education to how to cook the product, uh, because uh, the, the consumption of processed food has very bad impact in terms of uh, nutrition, health, with uh, the explosion of uh, obesity, for example, everywhere in a developed country. And so there is a need to, to go back to, uh, to, to more natural, uh, natural food. And also this uh, processed food has a bad impact in terms of uh, biodiversity, environment, and so on. So the, there, that's the first uh, point I, I, want, I would like to, to add. The second one is that uh, for education, what we, what, what we can see also is that uh, there is an issue around what I, I call food justice. Uh, it's not everybody that uh, has this problem with uh, uh, not being able to uh, to to be uh, to be aware of the quality of food, to be uh, uh, aware of the need to change uh, the the diet and so on. So the, there is this uh, this issue that is very important because the impact of uh, um, processed food uh, is not exactly the same depending of uh, your social status. Uh, and we can see that the impact of this uh, uh, in agro-industrial model uh, is, uh, is worse for uh, uh, low-income categories. So there is this need um, both to deal with education for this kind of population, uh, mainly for the young, youngest generation, and also to give an access to this kind of population to fresh and local food. Because as we saw before, it's more expensive usually. Um, we'll soon uh, show you another video. And I think this first part has all sort of tapped into things about being close around food. Um, and now we'll see someone or in a couple of minutes that is going foraging. But before that, Erik, I would like just to, um, to ask you as a sociologist, and, and now we've already sort of touched on, as Frederick said, there are almost two parallel tracks. You have one group eating more processed food and one group eating more local food or being more aware of quality, or maybe it's it's same group doing different things. But as a sociologist, uh, what how do you see people's expectations of the origin of their food um, developing these years? Uh, yes, uh, of course, what is important to, to understand is that the new wishes are not shared 
uh, by all the population. They are only shared by certain social groups. In general, the most educated, the wealthiest social classes, and sometimes the young generations. If we uh, remember what was the situation uh, before or just after the Second World War, uh, the consumers had a small number of wishes about food. What did they want? The consumers, uh, they wanted, uh, of course, uh, uh, immediately after the end of the, of the war, uh, they wanted enough food. Of course, they wanted uh, satiety. But after, they wanted four major wishes. Number one was food safety. Uh, price, convenient as a practical aspect of food, and good taste, especially for French people. And an important point was that these expectations were shared by most people who formed the middle class, and the middle class had become the majority of uh, the population in Western society. But the recent big change is that over the past decade, many new expectations had uh, they emerged, and they are not shared by the whole population. I can mention rapidly, but we've already uh, seen that, the respect for environment, biodiversity, the fight against climate change with the carbon footprints are concerned of only a, a little part of population in reality. Uh, the naturality of the product, the respect of animal welfare. Young people are very uh, concerned by this question, animal welfare and environment. Um, the quest for tradition is another expectation because tradition is reassuring. And at the same time, we have the desire for the food innovation. And for me, the most important is uh, uh, the... The, the major expectation for me is the need to know, the need to know everything about the food. Where does the food product, product come from? What is in it? Uh, where do its different ingredients uh, come from? How has this food been produced? With pesticides, with additives? Uh, who produces this food? But, and why this need to know? for two reasons. Because first, the consumer is more and more worried about what's he, what he's eating because of the food scandals, because of the media and social networks, because of the cacophony about food, because of the loss of landmarks that were formerly given by culture, by family, by uh, uh, religion, uh, etc., the local tradition. The consumer is worried and he wants absolutely to know what he eats, what he incorporates into its own body. And this, you know, it, this is an anthropological, uh, anthropological need. Every homo sapiens thinks I am what I eat, I become what I eat. And if you don't know what you eat, you don't know who you are. And in this context, two expectations have become priorities, not for the whole population, once again. These two uh, expectations are the geographical proximity of food, local, local food, and the social proximity of food. I want to know the person who produced uh, my food, uh, at, uh, of course, because it's, for me, highly reassuring. And I think it's in, important to see that many, many new expectations have emerged, but these expectations are not shared by the whole population, and we have different social groups, as Frederick, Frederick said. Thank you very much, Eric. And now uh, we would like to show you a video with a Danish uh, architect who is also um, finding a lot of the food he eats in the nature just around him. And he's not only finding food for himself, he's actually also selling some of the food that he finds um, for restaurants. So let's meet Alexander Damsko. My name is uh, Alexander, and um, I'm an architect first, maybe, or most of the time. I've been foraging for the last 14 years, professionally, for restaurants. My father took me to the forest 
uh, mushroom hunting uh, since uh, you know since I could walk and so so it started as a like a, a treasure hunt it's um, in the same family as uh, the watercress that that normally grows in in uh, running water but this grows where it's more dry and it doesn't have the watercress has a um, a dangerous uh, uh, what's parasite the hunting that's the reason I did it and and the reason I started uh, to do it again 14 years ago I was well, mainly sitting in front of a computer uh, doing architecture at a, an architectural office. To begin with, it was a kind of um, escape from uh, the computer. And uh, so it started with the, with the mushroom, because you, you, you focus so much with the, with the eyes and, and the sm smelling and everything, so you forget all the other stuff. It's very late for this, or very early. <laughs> Normally it grows in, in grass, in big uh, circles, and it's very common, but not at this time of year. And then, of course, there's um, the, the, what's it called, black fungus, like the Judas ear that you use, that, that grows on um, elderflower trees, close to the water. It's also, most of the year. I've always been uh, very fond of eating and uh, cooking since I was very small. So it was also a way to um, to the restaurant kitchens from the back and have a talk and a correspondence with the uh, with the people who are going to use the the ingredients. Sometimes I introduce things to the chefs. Uh, things that I stumble upon, but uh, just as often it's uh, the chefs that have, you know, heard about something or uh, read about it in a book or tasted it in another country, or uh, and they ask if uh, if uh, if I can find a specific uh, berry or uh, plant or mushroom. You actually have a lot of uh, different food just outside your, your door or just going into the forest or even, you know, going through a park in, in, in the cities or whatever. It's all over the place. And, uh, you know, of course, you have to be careful with, um, you know, polluted uh, ground. Strandville is a kind of a beat. Like, I think maybe before the, the red beets were introduced. It was this, uh, where you eat the, the leaves. They are also very succulent. One of the very interesting things about these, um, especially the, the, the plants, it's, it's so, uh, so different the taste even in, in, in the same plants just uh, the difference from uh, you know if you if you find it uh, uh, very close to the sea or even you know it can be maybe the same plant uh, growing uh, 10 meters away or 10 meters more inland or whatever that you can when, when you taste them there's a, there can be a, an enormous difference in the taste even within the same species. That's very interesting, that, uh, that, the same, that there's such a big difference, even in the same plants, you know, compared to when you, you buy something from a, a greenhouse or whatever, where it's, it's much more uniform, the taste. The wild things you can eat that has to, you know, uh, survive in the wild, it has to struggle more to you know, c compared to conventional uh, vegetables and, and herbs, you know, it has so much going on when it's in the wild, and it has to, it has to fight with a lot of other plants. 
and I, I have an idea that you can sense the vitality in, in, in the plants because it has, it has to use a lot of uh, force to, to live <clears throat> and fight with the other plants. If you're especially interested in, in the mushrooms, if you want to find uh, mushrooms, then uh, you know it, uh, the the older the forest, uh, you know the the mushrooms uh, they they have uh, they live a symbiotic uh, life with the uh, with the trees and the roots. So it's uh, and the the older the trees are, and uh, the more the the forest is left alone, you know, with the rotten trees and stuff like that. And, the, the, the more mushroom life. So, so you, you go out there and start looking and uh, you always find new interesting things and then you just have to, and you look them up and trying to find out if uh, you die from eating them or you, you just get a little sick. That's why you have, uh, that's why you get kids. So you try it out on the kids. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, experimenting when you find new things because there's so many things. This is the, the bladder, the t type with the bladders. You see the bladders here? And uh, so you take the, when it's fresh and when you pick it from the sea, then you take the, 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 the last part here and then you can just, with a little, bit of uh, olive oil and, and, and heat it in the oven or uh, on the pan and it gets extremely crisp and super nice like a little snack the kids like it this is yeah this is one of the, the few things when uh, when I come home with things from uh, nature then uh, this is a favorite mushrooms they are, they are fed up with mushrooms <laughs> Right, indeed, a very inspiring video from Alexander about how you can find healthy and free food just outside your door. Um, and it's also a trend that has been growing the last decade here in Denmark. Um, but now let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges with short circuits, um, because we talked about environmental impact. Um, you could also talk about being self-sustained. Are we sure that we can, could be self-sustained if we each of us had a small garden? What would it take? We are a growing population on the, on the planet. Um, could we, each of us in, in smaller areas, be self-sustained depending on climate, etc.? cetera? Um, but I would like to start with the environmental impact because I know, Frederick, that it is something you have, have worked on or looked upon. Um, is it always better for the climate to buy local food, or is it more complex than that? Yeah, yeah. We usually people think that uh, the more local, the better for the planet, uh, but it's not exactly like that uh, because uh, it depends on the, the kind of production you have. Because uh, what is very important to understand with local product is that there is no code of practice. So the means of production and the kind of product you will uh, put on the market, uh, it just, it's just a guarantee uh, of this product, that this product is coming from pro geographical proximity. It, it says almost nothing about the quality, about the environmental impact and so on. So that's very important. And if you compare it with, for example, uh, geographical indication or organic product, you have a more precise code of practice. Uh, that, that doesn't mean it has a, it has a positive, uh, not a, a negative impact uh, on uh, environment, but at least you have some rules uh, to produce the goods. Uh, and so the question we, we ask and uh, what we analyze in the in the project is uh, if you if we look at the uh, uh, real practices of uh, farmers that are uh, committed in uh, uh, local food, uh, food uh, circuits, 
can we find something like uh, more sustainable practices? And what we saw is that uh, you have a um, more important part of those, of those farmers that practice organic farming. That, that's the first result that's quite interesting. Uh, because if you uh, if you look at the situation in France now, we have almost 10% of the of the farmers that practice organic uh, farming. Uh, we find more uh, if you if we look at uh, uh, um, short secret produces. Uh, what is also important is that uh, you have something like um, a confidence relation with the con between the farmers and the producers. So it's very important to understand that uh, they cannot do uh, crazy things because uh, the, the, there is this link, this social link that that make uh, that create uh, a specific relation with the consumers. So uh, that orient the production to something that that is uh, more sustainable is not, uh, of course, not uh, the case for everyone. But usually, and they try to to have something that is at least um, uh, eco friendly. And uh, uh, another point is that uh, those kind of uh, producers, as it was mentioned in the in the very good uh, film that we saw, uh, try also to give a better valorization of the local resources. That means uh, veg local. Uh, uh, vegetables, herbs, uh, local uh, rice for uh, animals, for example. So that uh, th that has a positive impact on the preservation of biodiversity by taking uh, putting an attention to the uh, possibility of uh, local races, local seeds, and so on. And the last one, not uh, to be. And try, trying not to be uh, too long. Uh, last point is about uh, logistic issues. Uh, because uh, what we saw is that um, people believe that uh, the shortest, the better. Uh, in reality, it's not the case. And uh, because you have the producer that have to, to move uh, from one point to another, a lot of consumers that uh, are, are obliged to, to take the car, to go to the farm and to buy the product. Uh, so it's very important to organize uh, the, the procurement of local food uh, by a, a good organization of the logistic, logistic systems. Uh, otherwise, it, the, the impact on environment uh, is not so good. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. And, and one thing I was surprised to hear, uh, I think a year ago, was that it was actually, when it comes to the CO2, it was better to buy tomatoes yeah. grown under the sun in Spain, transported yeah. with a truck to Denmark, <laughs> than yeah. buying tomatoes grown in a greenhouse with artificial light and artificial heating here in Denmark. So, you know, it's yeah. really complex to navigate in. Um, but in my opinion, maybe it comes down to that we should accept that we cannot eat, eat tomatoes year round, we cannot eat strawberries year round, we cannot mm. eat apples year round, as they did in, in my grandparents' times. But um, now I'd like to, to get back to you, Christopher, because you said that it was hard to make really good money from being a, a private gardener. But do you think when it comes to self-sustainability to able to, to produce food enough, because I know that's something they also discuss at, at the EU level, but would you feel confident as a gardener with your own piece of land that you could produce food enough to make you and your family full year round? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, that can be managed. Like right now, we don't. Yeah, we hardly buy any vegetables. We buy some cucumbers here in the winter time. I have some very cucumber hungry kids, but uh, yeah, and they are kind of uh, denying to eat all the all the brassicas, all the cabbage, and the and the lovely roots. But uh, I think it's like it, it's no problem to be self-sustainable or, or to be self-sustaining uh, in in vegetables. And but, when, uh, 
yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's no problem growing vegetables. It's uh, like you uh, you sow a seed, you observe uh, what's go what goes on, you uh, watch uh, the weather, you plant it out. Like uh, yeah, you can. You, it's kind of like uh, baking. Like you can uh, baking a, a cake. You follow a recipe, and then you get a get get a cake, and then uh, depending on how uh, observant and how uh, yeah, how good you are, basically uh, the cake will taste thereafter. So it's like uh, yeah, so so I... anyone can do it. The problem is getting rid of all the vegetables that you have grown to a fair price. So that's why you need uh, someone to pay in advance, basically. So you have to like not put a price on the vegetables uh, themselves, uh, but you, but rather put a price on your working hours. So you can say that you'll be working, I don't know, uh, 20 hours a week. And uh, for that, you want, uh, I don't know, 250,000 Krona or something. Maybe that could be an agreement. And then the, the vegetables themselves, they are free. It's not a high salary, of course. But uh, then the, the restaurant or whoever wants the vegetables, they have already, they, it's a prepaid product. It's like uh, buying, a, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's like, yeah, all that um, uh, funding where you put in money before something is developed, crowdfunding. So it's basically like crowdfunding uh, vegetable production. Hmm. And I guess that the issue is that if you want local grown food, it, it takes more manpower. It's a question of putting more hours in it uh, compared yeah, to yeah. industrialized food grown in, in other parts of the world, also where wages are lower. Um, yeah. Eric, um, we already talked a little bit about this um, social classes and, and that it seemed like since it costs more, now to buy local foods that there can be a, a challenge with poorer people not being able to buy this high quality food so it's easy for us as you know higher income people to say you should all buy buy local food what if they can't um so how do you see the challenges and do we need to still import food uh, in order to make sure that everybody can afford food or, or how do you see it Yes, um, it's true that today one, according to be one of the main uh, weak points of short circuits are the price. In any hypermarket in France, you always will find tomatoes from Spain, for instance, less uh, expensive than local tomatoes. And the issue of the higher price is the same with uh, organic food. I, I think that we can imagine um, several solutions. The first solution is individual. It would be to consider that local food has a great value and we have to pay for this value. And local food has a great value for many reasons. I, 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 we, we know all that. Um, but the, the great value has a price. And in France, we see more and more consumers, uh, they, they are okay to pay a little more better for quality food, for local food, for organic food. At the same time, we see uh, people, they try to eat less or they try to reduce their consumption of meat uh, because uh, in France, meat is the most expensive, uh, most expensive produce you have in your uh, hypermarket trolley. And savings could be invested in better quality, could be invested in, uh, in local food, in organic food. Uh, and uh, we can also reduce uh, food waste. It's a uh, fight very popular in France, uh, food waste. It's uh, another source of saving. But I think that uh, another solution could be, would be, um, or should be a political solution. It would consist to pay farmers, not only for their productions, but also for the service, the services of general interest they provide or they could provide to society and uh, for me it's a, a, an a important uh, important point prices for local products could be kept low if farmers could get an additional income for instance from the common agricultural policy and farmers would would be paid with dignity which is not the case today for many of them and the last point maybe uh, 
you know, we all know the economic and social impacts, the dramatic economic and social impacts of the pandemic COVID-19. And uh, for instance, in a survey conducted in last September in France, 15%, uh, 15% of French people said in, in this survey, they had often or sometimes to skip meals because of lack of money, not to reduce their consumption, but to, to, to skip meals because the lack of, of, of money. Then, even if there is a desire for, to buy local products or organic products or better quality products, even if there is a purchasing uh, desire, it lacks the buying the purchasing power. And one response in France is to distribute to poor people uh, food vouchers that uh, could uh, only uh, uh, be used to buy a local product. It's an idea. But I think that another idea would be in order to avoid dependency and to avoid assistance is maybe to create a universal income for food because food is a universal right, isn't it? And we can. Uh, and with the pandemic, I think it's a, it's a moment to, to think about a new solution to, to solve this problem of uh, um, the, how, how do you say in English, la fracture alimentaire, the, help me, the, the, the gap. The food the, gap. The food <laughs> gap, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Frédéric. Thank you very much, Eric. And I just saw that you raised your hands, Christopher. Uh, yeah, that was just a, a small comment, uh, Eric, uh, to the, the thing you said about uh, making a like a top-down uh, uh, government uh, solution or a state-level uh, solution, where you implied that we uh, could make some kind of uh, subsidy for uh, for small farmers. And I have to say that I'm not a big fan of subsidies because uh, if you look at the EU and how the whole subsidy system works in the, in the EU, it really gives uh, the advantage to to the, the big farmers. Like I have no use of uh, subsidy because I'm I'm too small. I like the, the amount of money that I would get in subsidies. It's just like simply, uh, yeah, it's not even worth the time uh, applying to get the money because uh, it's so little, but I'm still producing a lot more than a, a, a regular conventional or organic industrial farmer would do in the in the same area of, area because I work in different levels and uh, and stuff. So it's just to, to give a little uh, perspective on the whole uh, subsidy and the like uh, kind of quick uh, quick fix uh, way of doing it. Because uh, the, yeah, in this case, the subsidy is is one of the uh, one of the main motivators for why our food system works in the way that it does with big industrial productions and not the uh, small scale local uh, farming. Which, by the way, the UN uh, uh, suggests to be uh, one of the best ways of feeding the growing world population. So it's not empty uh, where it's coming from here. Tafra, then I just jump in with two questions. Um, quick. If, if there is a, a, an article, a read, because I came across an article from 2014. Um, pointing at the fact that small farms can be the solution to the global uh, resource issue and, and the climate issue. But I would love if you have, um, if you have a, a recent article, it sounds as if from UN, if you could share that with me. That was the, that was the first one. Um, my, I don't know, I can, how can I share you with my email address, but we find out maybe. Do that afterwards, yeah. Or I can write, maybe some, somebody from L'Institut Francais can write it down. So it's Klaus, my first name, at um, myersmel.dk. The second question, because it's super, super practical. Uh, if you have any idea as to how to find a vegetable farmer in, uh, in London uh, who could do the kind of work that you are doing, I would, I would love to be connected and I will, I will do everything I can to sustain his... Uh, this business in a, in a, in a market in a market driven way it's really nice we're not only talking big ideas we're also making practicalities happening happening we are changing the world so that is great and and i would just like if you could uh, chris kelsen bring in a very short comment because i would like to skip to the next um, subject and we need to see a video but you all have so much on heart but chris 
now we just heard um, maybe Eric and Frederick talking about uh, we need some changes, maybe from political level. And I do think actually that Christopher is, does agree that we could use some political changes, but he's not into subsidies. So Chris, uh, working with alternative food networks, very short, what do you see as the biggest thing that could be done from a higher level to change the way we eat and produce food today, you know, produce food today? Yeah, well, you, of course, uh, there are the macro level tools like taxation. And, and if, if you're going to imply uh, climate related taxation, then you could reduce uh, food ta taxation, of course, uh, that has been suggested in many contexts. It's a really heavy policy uh, domain to uh, make any changes, but uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that it can be used in an intelligent matter. But I think one of the, my overarching points would be that we need a different gender strategy. We, we also need uh, the uh, uh, citizen to citizen initiatives like the food communities, uh, engage citizens uh, who, create an economic organization like the one Christopher is um, in, embedded with, uh, with, within. But public policies are very, so I think public procurement as uh, one example is all, also one of the effective tools. Uh, that is of course not an entirely uh, straightforward uh, enterprise, but the, uh, for example, the municipality of Copenhagen have had very positive results uh, sourcing from the region of Zealand. Uh, so I would say uh, pursue different tracks uh, and uh, in terms of balancing objectives, it's just very important that we make intelligent choices. No, sorry, not necessarily intelligent, but very wise choices because it's important to balance. Climate is not the only thing to pursue here. And, and I heard some uh, colleagues from abroad using the term climate autism to uh, describe the um, very single focus on climate. And I've e even heard people argue that, uh, say, organic dairy farming, which is a huge sector in Denmark, that they would be willing to uh, abolish uh, grazing cows uh, in order to reduce uh, environmental impact uh, in terms of cl climate gas emission from grazing animals. And I think that would be uh, a a loss uh, if, if we just focus narrowly on, on uh, climate gas emissions and, and then uh, simply didn't care about uh, animal welfare, biodiversity, taste and, and loads of other issues. So I think there, there's definitely um, a need to emphasize making wise choices uh, in policy. Uh. Thank you very much, Chris. And I think that's what we are doing today, hopefully being wise, but I, I mean, we're pursuing these different tracks, as you mentioned, you know, Christopher and Klaus already sharing knowledge. I hope we reach a lot of you out there. Maybe you get new ideas, new knowledge on that you can actually go into these community supported agricultures. At least I'm getting a lot more intelligent from all the answers you give. And I can see that you have raised your hand, Friedrich, but I would actually, because we only have a little more than 20 minutes left, so I would really love to share the next video with you, who's a French uh, star chef who moved to Denmark years ago, um, and he's growing his own food now, and his name is uh, Francis Cardinal, and uh, the video will come now. Je viens du Pays Basque, dans les Pyrénées. Je suis cuisinier. En tant que cuisinier, on voyage beaucoup. Et ce qui est arrivé, en fait, qui m'a sauvé la vie, c'est d'être marié à une viking que j'ai rencontrée à Paris et qui m'a fait déménager au Danemark. où J'ai ouvert pas mal de restaurants avec une philosophie toujours de, de travailler avec euh, très près de la nature et des petits producteurs. Je suis français, arrivé au Danemark. Où est-ce que je vais trouver mes produits Au lieu de les commander en France, est-ce que je peux travailler avec la proximité de mes petits producteurs C'est ça que j'ai trouvé très intéressant les dernières 32 années. C'est cette histoire que je trouve qui est, qui est intéressante. Si je trouve un poulet, qu'est-ce qu'il mange Où est-ce qu'il vit 
quel est le terroir autour du poulet et, et c'est ça qui va me parler, qui va me dire, ok, mais je peux faire un plat déjà à partir de ça. D'où je viens, c'est facile. Il euh, y a les piments, il euh, y a les tomates, il euh, y a le poulet, on fait un poulet basquez. Qu'est-ce que je vais faire au Danemark Alors en fait, la, la proximité des produits est très importante pour moi, puisque c'est une, une histoire et une culture. Je pourrais très bien faire venir le poulet euh, du Pérou ou des états unis ou d'Argentine et tout ça. Mais je ne connais pas le produit, je ne connais pas les personnes qui sont derrière. Je veux acheter à quelqu'un que je peux regarder dans les yeux, qui a les mêmes valeurs sur la culture gastronomique, sur les produits. Si je parle pour moi-même, oui, la gastronomie est un langage. La gastronomie, c'est mon outil de travail. Et grâce à ça, et sans me parler ni l'anglais ni le danois, j'ai réussi à m'adapter ou à m'acclimater dans un autre pays. Donc oui, la gastronomie est un langage. Et grâce à la gastronomie, j'ai réussi à connecter en fait avec le danois et les danois. Et euh, ils m'ont aussi ouvert, je dirais, leur estomac <rire> et leurs bras pour m'accueillir parce que je pouvais, grâce à mon langage gastronomique, me connecter avec eux. Je suis devenu cuisinier parce que d'où je viens, il n'y avait pas d'argent. J'avais faim tout le temps. Ma grand-mère était cuisinière italienne. Et donc, tous les après-midi, j'allais la voir dans sa cuisine où elle faisait à manger. Il sentait bon. Il faisait chaud et on n'avait plus faim. Le seul truc qui m'intéressait, c'était de manger, de voir les produits, les travailler. Et ma grand-mère, en dehors de ça, qui était cuisinière euh, fantastique, euh, je veux dire, euh, c'était euh, le, le lien automatique, quoi. C'est une transmission. Quand on, on évolue dans, un, dans le système à l'heure actuelle social dans lequel on évolue, il y a des choses qui sont euh, oubliées. Il y a des choses... On ne fait plus à manger avec ses enfants. Sur les enfants, on ne peut pas euh, leur demander d'être gastronome plus tard. Si on ne fait pas à manger avec eux, il faut leur montrer les produits. C'est une partie de l'éducation. C'est aussi une partie euh, très importante sociale d'être avec leurs, leurs parents dans une cuisine, faire à manger. Là, là tu as tout, euh, tout ce qui pousse ici, autour... Avec les œufs et tout, tout est local. Ça ne peut pas être plus local. Le lien social dans la gastronomie, pour moi, ça évoque euh, le temps. Il faut utiliser du temps. Euh, si on veut aimer quelqu'un, si on veut aimer quelque chose, ben, il faut utiliser du temps. On ne travaille pas assez avec ses sentiments. Et la gastronomie est un endroit fantastique, une très belle plateforme pour évoluer sentimentalement et euh, donner euh, beaucoup plus d'amour et des sentiments euh, positif aux gens autour de soi. C'est ça l'avantage quand on fait pousser ses propres légumes, on mange beaucoup plus de légumes. Voilà, c'est prêt. On mange <rire> Pour revenir à la diversité et euh, euh, connecter à la gastronomie, pour moi, ici, d'avoir déménagé à la campagne, je vois en fait mon chou euh, grandir, je vois ma tête d'ail euh, grandir. Et à chaque étape, ma tête, ma, ma cervelle de cuisinier me dit « Oh, pourquoi j'ai jamais eu euh, l'idée de travailler euh, quand l'ail monte par exemple ?» C'est magnifique. En attendant le ramsloy, en attendant l'ail des ours, ben, je peux travailler avec l'ail frais, l'ail yit, comme on l'appelle en France. Je peux travailler avec ça. Donc, d'avoir quitté, euh, je dis, comme je dis toujours, d'avoir quitté la, la ruche d'abeilles. La ruche d'abeilles, c'est les abeilles travaillent tout le temps. Et puis elles meurent. Moi, j'ai quitté la ruche, c'était trop bruyant, il y avait trop de bruit, pour me retirer à la campagne et... Le temps ralentit, boum, et je vois pousser la diversité. Je vois ce qui se passe autour de moi.
Je me rapproche du vrai temps parce qu'il y a beaucoup de produits qui sont éphémères. Et euh, les produits éphémères, eh bien, il, faut les, il faut être là. Il faut être là quand ils sont là. Euh, par exemple, l'ail des ours, euh, Ramsloy, euh, Podensk. Euh, l'ail des ours, il pousse. Si on veut la fleur, c'est quelques jours. Et puis, la fleur est disparue. Après, on a le, les feuilles. C'est un mauvais temps, s'il fait trop froid, ou ça disparaît très vite. Il faut être là. Mais il y a plein d'autres produits. Euh, il y a des baies qu'on ramasse quand, au, premier, quand, euh, au premier froid, c'est-à-dire quand il fait très froid, ou de, la température gèle. Euh, il y a des baies qui mûrissent, comme la nèfle, par exemple. Si on n'est pas là pour les ramasser, les oiseaux les mangent. So, il y a beaucoup de choses éphémères dans la, dans la nature, il faut être là. Et on n'est pas là quand on est dans son restaurant. Je suis retraité de la restauration, de la branche de la restauration. Mais cuisinier, je suis né cuisinier, je, je mourrai cuisinier. Euh, ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on ne peut pas, on peut pas l'enlever. Alors ça, c'est un essai. On l'a fait comme en France. C'est comme ça qu'ils font les vignes au château de Caix et à chaque coin il y a à chaque coin il y a un figuier ça c'est le figuier Brown Turkey c'est le, 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 le figuier de John Lennon on va voir ce que ça donne au Danemark parce que les figuiers il leur faut un peu de chaleur hein <rire> That was indeed a man who was really close to his food in, in every way. And I got for sure, I, I got very hungry from, uh, from watching it. So it was very nice. And um, now we'll talk for the last 15 minutes about more gastronomy, food in itself, eating together. And I need to ask you all to be a little surer in your answers because I would like to, to reach, uh, to ask all of you. And I would like to start with you, Eric, because you mentioned when we talked a couple of days ago that actually some years ago, the French meal has entered a very famous list, not sort of the food in itself, but yes. eating together. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, of course. Ten years ago, it was in November 2010, uh, UNESCO decided to inscribe the gastronomic meal of the French on the list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And as you said, it was not the French gastronomy which had been described, but the gastronomic meal of the French. And what is the difference? We are not talking about uh, products. We are not talking about dishes or recipes, which would be a material heritage. We are talking about the meal, that is to say for French people, a ritual. A ritual that uh, French people perceived as um, a part of their national identity. And I'm sure that some of you uh, know the main characteristics of the gastronomic meal of the French. The use of fresh products and if possible, um, if possible uh, local. The careful selection of dishes uh, reflecting the terroir and the diversity of France and of its regions and all begins with a, a trip to the market where you can exchange uh, knowledge and ideas and tips and recipes with producers, with other shoppers. And back home, everyone in the kitchen has a part to play and parents, they pass their know-how to their children. Uh, I don't think it's a, a beautiful table setting. The gastronomic meal of the French is not only just, doesn't just consist uh, of food, However, a uh, setting table is a very important. Of course, food and wine pairing, and last but not least, the conversations during the meal. In France, we, we are talking about food before eating, while eating, and after eating. And to finish, what are the, the origins of the, the roots of this particular relationship to food? I think that there were two or three factors, history, geography, and of course, culture. Already during antiquity, several centuries before uh, the Christian era, 
the people who lived in the territory of France were known for their love of food and drink. And I would like to clarify, to clarify a point. The Gauls did not eat white boars, no, only pigs. Don't believe what the comic book Asterix and Obelix shows you. <laughs> But actually, the, the two um, uh, birth certificate of French uh, haute cuisine, um, and with the pleasure of eating refined dishes, date from the king Louis, Louis XIV. As uh, the same king, he wanted the best products, the best recipe. And a, a last important date, a few years before the French Revolution uh, in uh, uh, 1789, uh, uh, um, the, it, it was was invented in Paris, the first restaurant uh, in the world. And the last, the second factor of the, is the great diversity of terroir in France, which provide an abundance and a, a large variety of uh, different uh, uh, products. And of course, the cultural factors, the know-how. So, it, and, and uh, finally, I would like to, you remember my, my, my baguette, and because I'm working in a scientific committee to to try to promote the traditional French baguette uh, to for its inscription on the list of the world cultural heritage. Thank you very much, and it's nice to hear that the baguette is on the list, or you're working to get it on the list. Yes, it's like to hear. Not done, but we we hope very much. Uh, Klaus Meyer. Um, how do you, as a chef promoting local food, Nordic food for many years, how do you see the social function of eating together, of, of actually eating the high quality food uh, together? Is, is that anything important to you or, or could we eat each of us, you know, alone, your high quality food? Yeah, not the latter. I mean, the meal that has been described, though I think it's a little bit strange to, to, to kind of attach or to, to protect a, a, the meal of a certain country of sorts, because I think if anything should be communal or popular or, or, or the, 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 the heritage of all the peoples of the world, then it should be the spirit of the French cuisine. Uh, but maybe that is also what, what I mean, what, what is meant by this uh, nomination or, or classification. <clears throat> but... Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, well, how can I say? Of course, I mean, I wouldn't mind sitting alone a few times uh, during a year and eating the most incredible products. I, I could live with not having my family or my friends around if it was just amazing food. I must say that. But but um, besides that, I think the, the um, what I could not live without would be Tons of meals with even mediocre food shared with people I love. Um, so I, I don't think you can, in this BC online world, you cannot overestimate the, the importance of uh, the concept of sharing a meal with people who mean something to you. I guess I should keep it short so I will... Okay. That was really, uh, really wonderful. I think it was a really nice question and, and I do agree. And Frederick. Um, I know you've worked many places, as I mentioned, also in less developed countries. How do you see the development? Because I have the idea that, you know, the more developed you become, the more iPhones, the more screens, the more busy, the more hectic, the more people, you know, look at the iPhone while eating, the less they eat together. Mm. Is that a trend? Or can you then see, you know, after having been very developed for some years, then you go back to eating together? Could you? I know it's a big question, but would you be able to say something meaningful in just a couple of minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, just to, uh, to mention first that uh, the, the cultural dimension of food uh, is not the same everywhere in the world. Uh, we have some countries where it is more important than others. And, uh, and also you have more, uh, some, some countries where the tradition is very diverse, very rich. So um, because of that, uh, the influence of uh, uh, foreign food, industrial food is not exactly the same everywhere in the world. But what we saw, and uh, that we, it's quite general, uh, is that when uh, countries emerge from uh, low income uh, to middle, uh, middle income and uh, come to, to development, 
uh, process. Uh, a large part of the population thinks that uh, the ancient plates, the ancient dishes uh, are something that are from the past. And they, they want to, to move for more industrial, more foreign uh, food. And uh, they, they, some of, sometimes they lose. They lose the tradition, they, they, they lose the, the food culture. Uh, for a main part of the population, mainly people that are uh, com uh, coming from the poor to the middle class. Uh, and at the same time, um, um, the, there are some part of the population, uh, indigenous or uh, uh, high wages, that turns back to the tradition and wants to promote and to preserve the, this local food and, and, and the local dishes. So that's, uh, once again, it's not uh, uh, an easy uh, and one way uh, process. It's something that is quite complicated, but uh, you have, you, we can see that we have those two movements. Uh, if I can just uh, add one point, um, uh, what is in, interesting in the French situation is that this year uh, as, uh, you, we have a new, some kind of innovation. Uh, we all know the Michelin, uh, guide and for the first time uh, we have uh, so uh, they introduce a kind of a green badge uh, to promote uh, the, and to encourage sustainable development in the, in the kitchen and they, they, they allocated this green badge to some uh, restaurants at one point and for and the other uh, information that I, I want to share with you is that for the first time uh, we have this year uh, a vegan restaurant that we that re receive um, a Michelin star. That means that uh, the French tradition for food it's a mix between tradition and cultural heritage and something that try to to in, to innovate to to make the, the, the to to push the, the walls. And that's, that's also a very interesting thing to, to see uh, because uh, there is a, 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 a commitment for uh, the new generation of, of chef to go through more seasonality, more local products uh, and more sustainable food. So they, are, they really want to, to mix one, uh, on the one hand the tradition and uh, on, the, on the other hand uh, something that is more sustainable. Thank you very much, Friedrich. Very interesting. And uh, Chris Kelsen, um, could you give us, even shorter, a brief, brief um, idea of how is the development in Denmark? Do we eat more together or less together? And has it maybe changed during the Corona crisis? I I think that uh, the Danish meal is not necessarily in the in a crisis. That, that uh, to my knowledge, we, we we don't eat less together than, than many other countries. So, I think it, uh, there's absolutely no reason to to say that the Danish common meal is in a crisis as such. And uh, so I think it it's still an uh, arena of uh, meaning, uh, which is. Of course, uh, we we can we can create uh, new stories, of course, which can add uh, add to the meaning of the meal, and I, I think it's a very important element to to also uh, explore possible stories uh, about the place where where you're living. Uh, that, for example, in uh, I, I brought this example of the cookbook from uh, Kao Estate, which uh, is a reconstruction of uh, Gulala Mel's, uh, I don't know the English term for Gulala, the, the golden age in Danish uh, literature and painting uh, in the 19th century. But, but that's like uh, <clears throat> some of the recipes that has been translated by uh, the, the local chef at Kaup, uh, where the recipes are from, uh, where the innovation is to take an old recipe and reshape it in, 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 into a new setting. And I, and I think that's a very fruitful process because it, it's, it's kind of identity work. And, and I think that's a very promising uh, way of, so uh, a broader, Range of people can find meaning within uh, local food. 
also to avoid the uh, the uh, possible uh, domination of a certain group of people. I, I think it should be uh, an open platform where various groups can find meaning. Thank you very much, Chris. And then the last question for you, Christopher Corsoy, because now you've been integrated or you've been part of this CSA community supported agriculture and you're growing your own food. And um, you told me when we talked beforehand that, that you could tell that there was this growing interest of people wanting to buy this food directly from you. Do you experience that people who are maybe part of growing their own agriculture, own products, or at least sort of taking responsibility to pay you and then get the food, do you feel that they are more concerned also about eating together, cooking together? Do you think these two things follow? Yeah, 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 basically, like, uh, but I think just like mainly quality, like if you have good quality uh, products that you're cooking from and you know the origin, then uh, then people, everyone will just be have a have a better time, like even though you're a terrible chef and you're just like uh, ruining the, the beetroot every time. Like uh, the quality of the beetroot really matters because it depends on whether the people eating it will will die from eating it or if they will survive and 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 live throughout the meal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think uh, like in general, like we just need to raise the bar on on the quality of our of our vegetables and uh, and all the groceries uh, because yeah, that's gonna raise the bar on uh, on our quality and, and the whole like sense of meaning as well that's what i can see in all the especially uh, in the young young people and the young families that are like uh, reaching out to be a part of these uh, csas and stuff is that it gives them a sense of purpose or an additional sense of purpose in their lives to feel that they are maybe changing a little bit um both with the with the climate situation and the biodiversity, uh, yeah, the crisis. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very I much. Think I think that sums it up pretty well that um, tonight's overall theme was close, or being close, closeness. And I think that we came to the point where if we come closer to our food where it's grown and comes around or come together preparing it, then we'll also come close socially, eating it together. We'll talk about the food. So um, it was very interesting, very thought expanding. And I think Klaus Meyer has some um, cauliflower, yes? Just to show. You can almost tell from looking at it how crisp it is. And here's the kohlrabi. It's half past six, we're all really hungry. So now we just Friedrich, you need to eat your cheese and yeah, everything you exactly. can get. And uh, you have all the wine we could drink for it. I also have a baguette. So if we were physically, <laughs> we'd have a feast now and celebrate closeness. Now we'll have to do it, close, being close to apart. I think that was the Danish theme when we thong, song together. I would like to thank the French Institute in Denmark. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Aarhus University, who also supported this, and Doc It in Aarhus. And I do know that um, if you out there, you would like to see more from this uh, La Nuit des Idées, then there's this year 24 hours of live web TV. And at a quarter past, no, 13 minutes past seven, I think. So maybe you should tap in at, at 10 past seven. You could see an interview with Klaus Meyer again. And you can do that by finding the the website for La Nuit des Idées, the, the, the overall website, or you can go into Institut uh, Francais here in Denmark to their Facebook site and they will put up the link right after this, um, this event and you can just have some food and then you can go back and watch the interview with Klaus Meyer. But thank you to all of us for being with us tonight and thank you very much to all the panelists. I think we could have talked all night, but then we would probably be too hungry but uh, have a very great evening and thank you to you Jean-Michel Pesci. Thank you. Very nice drawings that made me smile many times. So bye bye and have a nice have evening. Bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.